After World War II, American brands entered a kind of aerosol age, where companies eagerly embraced new technology that turned their products into a fine mist or foam with the press of a button. Aerosol cans became the container of choice for countless products. Paint, bug spray, hairspray, whipped cream, shaving cream, air fresheners, and toothpaste. And while many of these aerosol products were immediately popular, aerosol toothpaste was not so easily accepted among consumers. This is the story of why aerosol toothpaste was a total flop. As a quick side note, this video was inspired by another video from YouTuber Quixer, who covered the story of the game show cheating scandals of the 1950s. In his video, he mentioned that one sponsor, Colgate, used the game show to advertise its new aerosol toothpaste, which made me want to look into its history. I'll link Quixer's video and channel below in case you'd like to watch it. And with that, let's take a look at the history of aerosol toothpaste. The aerosol age began with World War II. In South and Southwest Asia, US troops faced danger not only from the battlefield, but also from disease. Chief among them was malaria spread by mosquitoes. To combat insect-borne diseases, scientists at the US Department of Agriculture developed a way to dispense insecticide using a liquefied gas as a propellant, so that when you press a button, it dispersed a fine spray that lingered in the air. This incredibly effective bug spray came in a heavy one-pound canister that resembled a large hand grenade, so naturally it was called a bug bomb. By killing any bugs that came in contact with this spray, the aerosol bomb was credited with saving many lives during the war. These insecticides and other aerosol products continue to be called aerosol bombs, or A-bombs, even after the war. Take for example this quote from newspaper reporter Jordan Barlow in 1949. Should a wicker chair or car fender need touching up, for example, the man of the house will be able to whisk through the job with an aerosol bomb loaded with paint. Or if the screen door squeaks, he can press a button and pff, the hinges will be oiled. Sister can drop a bomb into the pocket of her beach robe and before reclining on a blanket, spray herself with suntan lotion. If it rains and brother has a heavy date, all he'll have to do is spray his top hat and tails with water repellent. And if he's in a hurry, give his shoes a shot of polish from a bomb. The use of the word bomb in this context may sound strange now, but this was the atomic age. Troops returning stateside who had used aerosol insecticides during the war knew them as aerosol bombs. So it made sense to use the name GIs were already familiar with as canned aerosol bug spray transitioned from wartime to civilian use. Furthermore, World War II and the US atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan showed the incredible and devastating power of nuclear energy and brought bombs to the forefront of people's consciousness. And this consciousness continued into the post-war period, when optimism about the potential of atomic energy was contrasted with pervasive fears of a nuclear war and total annihilation. Now, newspapers were quick to differentiate between the A-bomb for aerosol versus atomic bombs, but that didn't stop the same papers from using wartime terminology to describe aerosol products. For example, they were dubbed a, quote, instrument of household warfare and described as commandeering a significant part of today's household chores. In the years following the war, aerosol cans were transformed. At first, they were very similar to the bulky grenade shape of wartime insecticides. These heavy, high-pressure aerosol bug bombs were expensive and were intended to be mailed back to the company to be refilled when depleted. But it didn't take long for a lower-pressure version to be developed, which used a lighter, less expensive canister made of the same material as a beer can. Initially, manufacturers thought that aerosol cans were simply a fad. Consumers would be drawn to the novelty of the latest push-button gadget, but would be discouraged by the price. But they were wrong. It turned out that consumers were willing to pay for the convenience and efficiency of pressurized products, which could dispense liquids faster and with less mess than conventional methods. And after only eight years on the consumer market, aerosol products could be found in millions of American homes. There were some 90 types of push-button products accounting for sales of $225 million. 
pressurized cans for dispensing anything from shaving cream to hairspray to pancake mix. Companies who thought that aerosol containers were just a fad had to eat their words. As reporter Sam Matthews wrote, these same profits are now busily stuffing their products into pressure packages. It seemed like anything that had to be brushed, squeezed, sprayed, or dispersed into the air was being put into an aerosol can. Some went as far as to wonder if instead of the atomic age, this post-war era should be called the aerosol age. And toothpaste would be the latest addition to the aerosol age. For more than half a century, toothpaste had been largely sold in a collapsible tube. The aerosol containers offered a new and novel way to dispense toothpaste. But there were some hurdles for manufacturers. Initially, aerosol products could only be dispensed as either a spray or an aerated foam. This worked well for products like bug spray or whipped cream. But market testing showed that consumers did not like products like shampoo, hand lotion, or toothpaste in an aerated form. They wanted their toothpaste to be, well, a paste. The second problem was that aerosol products used a refrigerant-type liquid propellant like chlorofluorocarbons, which you may know better by brand names like Freon. These refrigerant-type propellants were not safe for food products, including toothpaste. These two problems had the same solution, nitrogen. Nitrogen is a colorless, odorless, flavorless gas that can be used in food. Nitrogen can be used in place of a chlorofluorocarbon propellant to make aerosol toothpaste safe for consumers. They also required no shaking before use and kept toothpaste in an unaerated form, giving it a consistency closer to regular toothpaste. Manufacturers were confident that aerosol toothpaste would be the biggest thing to happen in the dentrophist market in decades, and none of them wanted to be left out. Colgate Palm Olive made it to market first with its power-packed Colgate Dental Cream with Gardel, but its lead was short-lived. Reportedly within a week, Rexall Drug, Procter & Gamble, and Carter Products Inc. were all testing their own aerosol toothpaste. And by 1958, nearly every toothpaste maker had an aerosol toothpaste product on the market. Morris Root for American Perfumer and Aromatics Magazine wrote, Should aerosol toothpaste be accepted by the public, and there is every reason to believe it will be, this could conservatively account for 100 million packages a year within a year or two. The problem was that aerosol toothpaste was not accepted by the public. Far from it, in fact. Despite its rosy outlook, aerosol toothpaste was declared a failure by the early 1960s. So what went wrong? First was cost. Aerosol toothpaste was more expensive than conventional tube toothpaste, with packaging accounting for approximately 80% of the price. For example, a regular tube of Colgate toothpaste was 69 cents. Aerosol toothpaste was 98 cents. Second, aerosol toothpaste looked nearly identical to aerosol shaving cream. Aerosol shaving cream was already well established and popular by the time that aerosol toothpaste made its debut. Some consumers simply passed by aerosol toothpaste in stores, thinking it was shaving cream. Others joked that they might mistake their shaving cream and aerosol toothpaste and apply the wrong one to their morning stubble or toothbrush. Lastly, aerosol toothpaste was… too weird. That's right, aerosol toothpaste was too weird for the same people who put ham in their jello salad. As a brochure on packaging noted, everyone seemed to feel that an aerosol container just didn't suit toothpaste. It was too bizarre, too different, somehow just not right. Ultimately, there just wasn't enough perceived benefits to aerosol toothpaste to convince consumers that was better than the ordinary, inexpensive collapsible tubes they were already using. And so the canned toothpaste became the aerosol industry's one, quote, major embarrassment. Now, it's worth noting that while aerosol products from this time period were seen as revolutionary, they were also deeply problematic. Aerosol bug sprays often contain DDT, a highly effective insecticide that was also hazardous to fish and birds, hurting overall ecosystems. And chlorofluorocarbons were discovered to deplete the ozone layer of Earth's atmosphere, leading to their ban in aerosol products. But that wasn't the end of aerosol containers. They now just contain propellants that aren't as damaging as chlorofluorocarbons were to the environment. It also wasn't the complete end of aerosol toothpaste. Every few decades or so, manufacturers give aerosol toothpaste another shot. 
In the 1970s, Dr. Care introduced an aerosol toothpaste that proved unpopular with families once their children realized they could use it to spray toothpaste everywhere. And in the 2000s, Aquafresh brought out an aerosol gel toothpaste that made headlines in the design world, but it too was discontinued. Even today, with additional options like pumps and tablets, tubes still reign supreme. The latest packaging innovations for toothpaste hasn't been replacing the tube. It has been making it recyclable to reduce the large amount of pollution created by plastic toothpaste tubes. And while industry experts in the 1950s predicted aerosol toothpaste would replace the tube, the toothpaste tube has and will likely continue to prevail. If you liked this video, please consider giving it a like and subscribing to my channel below. It really helps me out. Thank you again, and I'll see you next time.